I'll try to finish as quick as possible because when you know foreign body aspiration, that means you need to remove it to make the child better. That's online, uh, uh, like just of what I'm going to talk. My humble greetings to all my teachers for helping me to come to this level. Foreign body aspiration, it's a common pediatric respiratory emergency which can be life-threatening. Most of the time history is not forthcoming. So you have a wide variation in the presentation. The common age group affected is the first four years of life between one to three years is the most common. If you miss the diagnosis or if there is a diagnosis of foreign body aspiration, it can lead to serious complications. If the child presents within 24 hours of foreign body aspiration, we term this as an acute foreign body aspiration. Any presentation beyond 24 hours, we term it as a delayed presentation. The aspirated foreign bodies can be organic or inorganic. Why do you need to know about this? I'll tell you in a short while. Organic means nuts, seeds, bone pieces. Whereas inorganic means you have beads, coins, pins, small parts of plastic toys, school equipment, including the uh, uh, pen cap. Like um, these are all the common inorganic. Organic is the most common. And peanuts, you know, is the ubiquitous among the foreign bodies. There is minimal reaction to metallic foreign bodies or plastic foreign bodies. But in organic, you have more issues. That means substances which are lipophilic due to its fatty acid content. There is intense airway inflammation and granuloma tissue formation around the foreign body. Also, the organic foreign body has the ability to absorb water by its inherent nature. So because of this, it can swell and it can modify a partial obstruction to a near total obstruction over a period of time. I told you the common age is between one to three years. Commonly, this is due to lack of molar teeth, decreased ability to masticate, chew the food. Always they have a tendency to put anything and everything into the mouth. Not only that, they are more active. They talk, they run, they chew while chewing and they do all sorts of physical activity. Also, they have a higher respiratory rate. So any object which they keep in the mouth, there is more chance for aspiration. The symptoms, the penetration syndrome, we have a triad. That means a sudden onset of choking intractable cough and vomiting. This is the penetration syndrome or the triad of symptoms. It can lead to asphyxia very rarely to cardiorespiratory arrest, but most often it is choking, coughing, sudden onset of acute dyspnea in a well child or sudden onset of wheezing. So these are the common symptoms. Suppose if the foreign body has been missed, it can lead to persistent cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, hemoptysis, even failure to thrive. Undiagnosed and retained foreign body have more chances for early as well as late complication, including atelectasis as well as bronchiectasis. The final site of the location of foreign body either in the larynx or tracheobronchial tree, it depends on the size of the foreign body and the consistency of the foreign body. Anything which is there in the larynx and trachea is potentially life-threatening because it's going to cause central obstruction. The features of these are, if it is going to be a partial laryngeal obstruction, hoarseness, aphonia, wheezing, and dyspnea. Whereas if it is going to be more distal, that means in the bronchi, there is going to be unilateral wheeze or decreased breath sounds. And I told you retained foreign body, you can have like cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, and hemoptysis. Very rarely foreign body aspiration can be asymptomatic, especially when does it happen? Only if the aspirated foreign body has got a lumen in it. 
something like a, a ball pen cap. It allows air flow during both phases of respiration. So many a times it may be even asymptomatic except for occasional cough. Clinical exam, most of the time they will have respiratory distress with or dyspnea, with or without tachypnea. We need to be a central foreign body hypoxemia and subcutaneous emphysema is very rare. If there is going to be a subglottic foreign body, hoarse voice and strider can be seen. If it is going to be a central foreign body, a biphasic strider or a wheeze will be heard. If the foreign body is localized to one side, it can be localized wheeze or decreased breath sounds. Complications, we know severe airway obstruction and death in young children because of the small caliber of the airway. This is the life-threatening one. It can even cause death instantly too. But the late complication is bronchic basis. And if the retained foreign body is an organic, because of its ability to induce extensive local inflammation and form granuloma, it can lead to airway obstruction, add on to the airway obstruction, bronchoscopic identification and removal becomes more difficult. Sometimes they bleed profusely too. Diagnosis often not diagnosed immediately because they don't have specific clinical manifestations, but your history, suggestive history of choking. This is the classic clinical presentation with cough, wheeze, and diminished airflow. This indicates most likely this child had had a foreign body aspiration. Differential diagnosis, it can be acute severe asthma. In group, there is strider more than the wheeze. A very dangerous condition by neoplastic bronchitis. It is diagnosed only after a bronchoscopy. This can mimic a foreign aspiration. Though vascular trachea, H-type tracheoesophageal fistula, mediastinal tumors, they also present like this, but they are uh, going to have subacute symptoms or slowly progressive symptoms. Whereas your foreign body aspiration, most of the time, dramatic presentation. Investigation, everyone knows that everyone has to have a plain X-ray chest. This is the initial imaging modality. The classical abnormality is going to be a localized hyperinflation. We call it as obstructive emphysema in the affected side. You know, air trapping is there. That means it is going to be one lung is going to be darker. That indicates there is more air trapped in that particular lung but still you'll be able to see the bronchovascular markings. You see it's here, you're able to see the hyperinflation in the left side. Your diaphragm is flattened. You always have to differentiate from a congenital lobar emphysema. Always you need to look for collapse of the underlying or overlying lobes if it is going to be a CLE, because sometimes if we don't look at it in an X-ray lobby, we can get confused. Always look at the X-ray in the X-ray lobby, even if it means that you need to walk 10 steps to go to the X-ray lobby. Other abnormalities. Yes, you can have localized hyperinflation or atelic cases, or sometimes air leak. You are able to see air like under the heart. This is like pneumopericardium here, you are able to see air in the subcutaneous tissue, surgical emphysema. Here you are able to see atelectasis. Rarely you will be able to see an opaque foreign body. Sometimes you will be able to see, see through even in a chest X-ray, you are able to see a small opaque foreign body. Finally, it turned out to be a small teeth which was aspirated and we were able to remove it by rigid bronchoscopy. And many a times a forgotten technique is an inspiration and expiration. Previously forced inspiration and forced expiration, but even with a good inspiration and a good expiration, you'll be able to make out just like in this film. Here we have a doubt whether there is going to be a because it is slightly darker in the right side, but the expiratory film, you see the air trapping in the right side. This is an inspiratory expiratory technique. It is underutilized despite the contributions it can make. X-ray 
sometimes there can be difficulty in, in, uh, in the interpretation. Sometimes if it, a patient has got a rotated film, it can cause a unilateral lung hyperlucency. It can mimic an air trapping. How can we overcome? By doing the radio density ratio between the right and the left lung. If it is going to be only due to positional, then your radio density ratio is going to be less than one. If the radio density ratio is going to be more than 1.1, that indicates there is air trapping and you have to proceed with a bronchoscopy. Fluoroscopy previously, in uh, early 90s, late 1980s, we used to do fluoroscopy for making a diagnosis of like foreign body before the advent or much wider usage of flexible bronchoscopy. Computed tomography does not localize the foreign body. It reveals only the parenchymal changes due to the effect of the foreign body. Previously, virtual bronchoscopy was being tried in lieu of flexible scopy, but it does not contribute much. Flexible bronchoscopy, this is the investigation of choice for a diagnosis of uh, foreign body aspiration, or even when you are not able to, when, even when there is a possibility of foreign body aspiration, because it reveals the site of foreign body, nature of foreign body, presence or absence of the granulation tissue, which will not be revealed by any other investigation. This granulation tissue picking up is going to be very important when the foreign body is going to be removed by the ENT surgeon. If you tell them there is granulation tissue, they'll be very careful while removing. And it also helps the foreign body, once you're able to find out what is the nature of the foreign body, it helps the ENT surgeon beforehand itself to pick up the correct type of the ancillary instrument to remove the foreign body in the first attempt itself. And when you are going to tell the ENT surgeon, yes, this child has got a foreign body in this particular location, in the right side of the bronchus, then they are mentally prepared even before they do the procedure. And like uh, uh, the, you can remove flexible uh, foreign body by flexible bronchoscopy, but the small caliber of suction channel, this is one impediment. Number two, prolong time to grasp the foreign body. And number three, when you're going to try to remove the foreign body with flexible scopy, the tile has to breathe through the space around the scopy and not through the scope as in rigid bronchoscopy. So you can remove a foreign body with the help of flexible bronchoscopy, but at what cost we need to think of? Yes, definitely the child, even though we give oxygen supplementation, there is going to be a risk of hypoxemia. So wherever the chances, wherever you have the facility to have a rigid bronchoscopy, that is the mode of choice for removal of a foreign body in the tracheobronchial tree. Just this is how a foreign body is going to look like when you're going to do a flexible bronchoscopy, a video bronchoscopy. Here, you know, this is deep inside the left main bronchus you are able to visualize the foreign body. It is a organic, it is a groundnut seed. There is no granulation tissue, no pus outpouring, but there is some inflammation. CT, like many a times when they have a suspicion of foreign body, we have a tendency to even do a CT, but make sure that CT is not the sensitive modality to diagnose a foreign body. Even though you can do tracheobronchial reconstruction, you can try to find out the parenchymal changes. It does not tell what is the nature of the foreign body. It does not tell whether there is granulation tissue or not. Also, the risk of ionizing radiation, everyone has to keep that in mind. See, this is a child who had a sudden onset of respiratory distress with cough, he was symptomatically treated with nebulized short-acting beta-2 agonist. The symptoms persisted. So X-ray, antibiotics, antibiotics changed, the but the symptoms persisted. He was 
It referred to a higher center once the child did not improve with antibiotics. But what did the parents do? Many a times this happens. They go to doctor, another doctor. Doctor hopping is one common thing which the parents do. And one more x-ray. It shows definitely there is air trapping in one side. So what happens? They immediately go and do a CT as well as a virtual bronchoscopy. This did not happen now. This happened long time back when I was in my home hospital that was in children's hospital. I was able to see this, get this record. This is a virtual bronchoscopy. You are not able to see the details in a virtual bronchoscopy. This is a carina, this is the left main bronchi, this is the right main bronchi. You are not able to see what is there in the right main bronchus even though you know that there is some obstruction there in the right main bronchus. So finally, what happened? A flexible scopy, we are able to see granulation tissue and a foreign body, a vegetable foreign body, a groundnut, a half piece of groundnut. This was not picked out by any of the investigation, CT, X-ray, or even virtual bronchoscopy. So that is why we always say, whenever you have a suspicion of a uh, foreign body aspiration, kindly do uh, flexible bronchoscopy so that you'll be able to make a diagnosis. This is the same child after removal of the foreign body. Notorious for causing a granulation tissue or these two, betel nuts and tamarind seed. Even a single day with betel nut inside the airway, you can see extensive granulation tissue. So management. Removal is the treatment in foreign body aspiration. It all depends on the site of impaction of the foreign body. When do you do an emergency rigid bronchoscopy, especially if it is going to be in the larynx, subglottis, or trachea, when it is going to cause a central obstruction? If it is going to be in one of the main bronchus, then you can do it comparatively less airway problem, so you can do it electively too. Like, Rigid bronchoscopy is not available in all medical centers and not all ENT surgeons are good in doing a rigid scopy in small children, especially in less than 12 months, it needs a good skill. Otherwise, you can have bronchospasm. Also, technical difficulties to remove, to catch the foreign body and remove it. Also, if you are not good in your technique, if the rigid scope or the forceps touches the bronchial wall, or if you take a longer time to remove it, it can all lead to bronchospasm. Very rarely you can have complications. One is failure to extract, remove the foreign body. Second, you can injure the trachea. You can cause pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, sometimes injury even to the ocal cords. After the procedure, what complication can set in? You can have ocal cord edema. When it happens, how do you treat? We treat with steroids. Dexamethasone, it reduces the glottic edema in two days, like you give it for two days. If we have granulation tissue, even though none of the textbooks tells like to give steroids, this is what has been followed in ICH for a long period of time. When we see granulation tissue, we give steroids for five to seven days and taper and stop. And you have many algorithms when you have a suspected foreign body. If you have a foreign body, uh, if you have a witness choking, it is one. Noisy breathing is one. Unilateral reduced uh, air entry is one. New onset recurrent or persistent wheeze is two. Abnormal X-ray is two. If the score is less than one follow-up, score is two to three, then do a flexible scopy. If the score is four to five, a rigid scopy. A score is five means urgent rigid scopy. Otherwise, I will end up with rigid bronchoscopy if any one of the following, asphyxia, Radio opaque foreign body, unilaterally decreased breath sounds and obstructive emphysema. Flexible bronchoscopy in all other cases. If flexible bronchoscopy identifies foreign body, rigid scopic removal, 
is the ideal one. Yes, that is the end of my lecture, madam. Thank you for the opportunity.